All right, thanks, Chris, for the wonderful introduction. How's everyone doing? Good. All right, uh, I'm guessing this session is interesting for you for maybe a couple of reasons. One is you have uh, embarked the microservices journey. Yeah? Or the other is you have open API specifications and figure out, fig trying to figure out what to do with them. Yeah? All right, uh, so this session essentially is like uh, experience of the last four years have, trying to help a uh, couple of really large organizations who have embarked the microservices journey. They have hundreds of microservices, maybe in some case thousands of microservices, and all the microservices have, uh, you know, if they are using HTTP, then they have uh, open API uh, specification, and if they are using uh, asynchronous, like Kafka or some JMS or something like that, then they have async API specifications. And often those things go out of sync, uh, they're not up to date. And the whole reason for people to embark onto the microservices journey, at least a lot of clients I've worked with, uh, wanted to kind of speed their time to market, like reduce the time to market so they can get to, the, uh, to market as quickly as possible. And why is that the case, right? Because the idea with microservices is that I can have really small teams building these microservices and deploying them uh, to production independently. Correct? How many of you have been able to realize that in your organizations? Maybe. And, and one big challenge in my experience, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that while we have teams being able to independently build these microservices, uh, if you have deployed to production, you might have realized that there's some integration issue or things like that, and so quickly teams want to, you know, even though some microservices are ready, they want to make sure all microservices are ready, they integrate them, test the whole thing, and then they want to deploy them to production. Right? At least that was kind of one of the main challenges that we were seeing in organizations. And so this talk is uh, a solution, not the only solution, but a solution of how we can address that. We built a little open source tool called Specmatic. So I'm going to try and demonstrate that. So for today's uh, demo, I'm going to take uh, you know, an app which basically makes a request to a BFF layer, uh, backend for frontend layer. Uh, which in turn then calls a domain service. You could have one or more domain services, right? And the domain service gets you back a response. Uh, now, at this point, you might want to log this message onto a Kafka topic so that your analytics services can pick it up and do some analytics on top of it, and finally respond back to the application, right? I'm going to use this as an uh, example for today, and surely uh, no organization has this simplistic uh, microservices architecture. Probably it's a lot more complicated. I'm going to show you a little later about a, another tool kind of insights, which is there in Specmatic, which kind of helps you visualize all your microservices, the dependencies between them, and stuff like that. All right. Uh, now, generally, what you would do is you would uh, create an open API specification for your BFF layer so that your app can independently start developing things. Similarly, your uh, BFF layer can independently develop things and deploy. Uh, same way you would have a BFF layer and uh, between the domain service, a uh, open API specification. And for things like Kafka, JMS, and asynchronous, you would have something like a, uh, async API specification, right? Uh, how many people are familiar with open API specifications? Go show of hand. Oh, cool, that's quite a lot. How about async API? A few, okay. It's not as popular, but it kind of is the very same idea for async uh, you know, uh, stuff. So with that, I'm gonna jump into a live demo. Most of this is gonna be a live demo, and I would like you to guide me what to do next, all right? Cool, rolling up the sleeves a little bit as we get in. So uh, let's start with, uh, so right here I have a, uh, my uh, order API, which is the domain service, so I'm just gonna 
uh, start that, so you know I'm not faking this. So I've just got the order service kicked off. While this brings up, let's also bring up Kafka. So I'm going to start uh, Kafka here. Okay. And I'm going to start my BFF layer. So I've kind of triggered all of these. All right, it's a little Spring Boot app. It's just coming up. It's going to run on port 8080. And uh, let's see. Yep, Kafka is already up. It's listening for topics on product queries. Uh, let's see. This guy is also up and running on port 8090. Yep. Cool. So let's uh, just quickly make a curl request and see if everything is OK. Sure, I have one product in my database, and it's returned that product. So at this stage, everything's wired up. right? So remember the diagram I just showed you? We have an app, which is making requests to the BFF layer. Uh, so this curl is essentially the app which made a request to the BFF layer, which in turn went to the domain service, uh, which is running here. Right? This is my domain service, the order API, which returned the response back. And then it put a message onto Kafka. So you can see here Kafka got a message. All right? So all of this is wired up, which is great. So now I have an open API specification. Okay, Let's look at this uh, open API specification. I'd actually go to the, so what you can see from here is essentially it has three Parts in the open API specification, a slash, uh, slash find available product, uh, which essentially takes a query parameter called type, and it is not required, it's optional. It also takes a page size, which is uh, in the header, and that is of type integer, and it's mandatory. Uh, it gives you back three responses, 200, 400, and 503. Uh, we have something called orders. We have something called product. On product, I have a post request that I can make, as you can see here. And it has three mandatory fields, name, type, and inventory. And you'd notice the type is an enum, uh, which has four possible values. Right? That's kind of the job of a open API specification. Most of you will be familiar. So I've kind of just got this all documented. Now my question is, I want to verify if this open API specification and the BFF, uh, the service that I have, are they in sync or not? Right? How would you verify that? How would you verify if your open API specification is in sync with your actual implementation? Static code analysis is one way you could do that. You could have uh, API tests that could verify, uh, someone could look at the open API specification, write tests, API tests, and make sure that works, right? I'm gonna show you a third technique today, all right? Uh, it's a plugin, uh, so I'm gonna say run contract tests, all right? And what it does is it brings up a little uh, UI here. Uh, what it basically is pointing is to where my open API specification is, the API specification that we were just looking, and where is your application running, right? Localhost 8080. With that, let's run and see what happens. Cool. It's run seven tests. Five of them have succeeded. Two of them have failed. Zero lines of code at this point, right? Just take the open API specification, use Specmatic, and it generated the test for you. What did it generate? How did it figure out what test to generate, right? Uh, let's look at this in a minute. Let's scroll to the beginning of this. And so that was the command I ran. So it basically said, hey, I, saw, I figured out that slash products is a route that you have, uh, endpoint, and it requires three mandatory parameters. So I've basically plonked in some random values for these. Of course, wherever type was uh, an enum, so I've picked those values. So it took gadget, and it generated a request, and it got an ID back zero. And it says, OK, so this particular thing was su successful. right?" And then it took and it 
changed it to book. This one, it generated gadget, uh, book. And so it just went through the four types. We have food and the fourth one is other. So it generated four combinations, just iterated through all of them and made sure all of them succeed. Uh, then it also slash find available products is another API. Uh, so it basically made a request and it got these two products back and it says, okay, this also seems to be working fine. So hence it says succeeded. And it said, what happens if I put some random type value and see, and of course that ended up in a 400 bad request, right? And the last one I think it generated is, uh, you know, a test with, uh, for uh, slash orders post, it created a post request, and this came back with a 404 not found. Uh, what was the reason for a 404 not found? Because this slash orders didn't even exist. What happened here? Let's quickly look here. So this is a quick summary that Specmatic spits out. It basically is called the API coverage uh, summary. And it says, hey, I found slash uh, find available products. It has three routes in it. Uh, I was able to cover uh, the first one. The other two I was not able to cover at this stage. I also found something called slash orders, which is uh, missing in the spec. What does this mean? Missing in the spec. So what Specmatic does is it basically, uh, if you're using Spring Boot or any of the uh, things, they expose something called as an actuator endpoint on which you can go and query saying, hey, can you tell me what all routes are available on this service, right? So it went queried, it got slash orders as a route that the actuator exposed. It went and looked in the spec and it says, I can't find it in the spec, right? And that's what it's saying, it's missing in the spec. But instead, it found something else in the spec which is not implemented. So it's there in the spec, but not implemented by the application. In this case, it turns out that it's a simple typo, as you can see, but it could be a seriously something that someone's missed implementing altogether. And it found another one which also it covered. So now, what do we do? We'll quickly look at how I can fix this, right? So I have uh, this specification. And uh, in this, if you see, it says orders, but actually it's a typo, should have been orders, right? So if I fix that and I go back and run my test, let me just clear this out before I run. So let's run this, see what happens. It's gonna again generate those same seven tests. And this time, sure enough, it's there's no more missing in spec or uh, not implemented. It's addressed those, and we have now 33% coverage on each of them. Why 33%? Because there are three uh, responses. We are able to only exercise one of them. With me so far? All of this with zero lines of code, just an open API specification, and Specmatic doing all of this magic for you, right? It's reading the specification, generating the uh, request, hitting the endpoint, and then getting the response and validating with the specification. Cool. Now I'm gonna show you something more interesting. Ready for that? Yeah? <laughs> cool. Uh, one thing you'll notice is that we have a few tests that are failing, right? And those tests are failing because uh, you know the specific uh, request that it's making, that's not available in our database, right? Specmatic can't really figure out what is inside your database, right? So you have to guide Specmatic to say, hey, you know, these are the examples or these are the values that are there in my database, so make requests with them, all right? So for that, what I'm going to use now uh, is I'm going to use, so let's go here. Uh, I want to enrich this specification with some examples, which are what is there in my database. So I'm going to use uh, generate examples, again, another uh, part of the Specmatic plugin, which is going to go ahead. And it's talking to GPT-4 at this stage. It's saying, all right. Uh, I've looked at the specification. I kind of understand your domain. Can I actually, instead of me sitting here and writing each of these examples by hand, can I just 
use GPT-4 to generate the examples for me, right? Because in this day and age, trying to sit and write these is a bit of lost cause. Uh, of course, GPT-4 is uh, the first time you're running, it's trying to fully understand the model and trying to then generate relevant examples for you, uh, which allows you to kind of, I mean, of course, this is a simple example and I probably spend next 15 minutes and do that, but why take the pain, right? And so GPT-4 has come back, all right? And it's saying, hey, I found and generated these examples for you, all right? So it's giving you a comparison, a side-by-side -side comparison. So it's put this success where essentially if I am doing a post on product, uh, then this should be uh, input and I should get back an ID one, which is an output. Uh, it's, it's generated a bunch of these examples. You'll also notice that the description and things like that it's generated is actually fairly relevant, right? It's not some garbage that it's generated. Uh, you know, if I use something like Faker or things like that you might be pop, uh, familiar with, that'll just generate some random values usually. But here we're able to leverage this and generate more meaningful value. So now that I have these uh, things, it's updated here, uh, right? Let's make sure they are, the examples are here. So now if I go ahead and run the test, what do you expect to see? Now it's executing three tests. Remember earlier it was executing seven tests. Now we have kind of said, hey, you know, use only these examples, right? And generate tests only for those. Don't go and generate all random examples. So you're kind of guiding it saying generate only these. And look here, what do we have? Success, success. Right? Isn't that cool? Without writing a single line of code. All right, but I'm not happy that I was earlier at seven tests and now I'm down to three tests. That isn't cool. So can Specmatic do something for us? I see this tick box, check box. Let's try and see what happens. I'm gonna click generative tests, all right? Let's clear this out. And I'm gonna say run tests with generative tests. Who? 41 tests. Just like that. What is it doing? Ooh, a lot of scrolling. It says, hey, I was able to generate 41 tests. Six of them are passing, and 35 of them are failing. What happened here? Uh, so I'll explain what generative test is and what it does, but let's first figure out why these tests failed so that we can fix it and then talk about uh, what happened. So as you can see, it's saying, hey, uh, when I made this request, I'm getting response body message, but the key named message is uh, in the response but was not in the specification. So what has happened here is it's generated a whole bunch of combinations which are generating a 400 response. You can see here it's generated 27 uh, responses, 400 combinations for us. And when, when I look at this, this is basically the keys. This is the, sorry, uh, this is the request that it's generated. You know, can notice for count, it's tried to put a string instead of a number and it is expecting to get a 400 response back, which it did get 400 back. However, the response schema did not match with what you were expecting. I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, let me just go down here. Let's scroll to, yeah, here is my bad request. So you can see uh, I've got a time status over here. Sure, I've got a timestamp as well. I've got a status, I've got an error. Uh, but here I've got path versus here I've got a message. Uh, looks like, again, the spec is out of whack with what is actually coming back. So I'm gonna just replace that, clear this out, and run the tests again. And it's gonna run again the same 41 tests, and I would expect to see 
all the tests passing at this stage, but let's see if that is actually true. Sure enough, 41 tests, all tests successful. But how did I get 41 tests generated, right? That's the interesting piece over here. So let's go look at some of the tests that this guy's generated. The initial tests are the standard tests that uh, we were generating, which it's now calling them as positive scenarios, right? Based on the examples that you had given. Uh, but then let's look at some of the negative scenarios over here. A bunch of positive scenarios. Here's the first negative scenario. So what has it done? It's basically taken name and made it null. Name is a mandatory field. It's made it null. And it's actually expecting a 400 back. And it did get a 400 back. And hence, it's saying this test is successful. OK, so this idea of generative tests kind of uh, was an inspiration we took from two different schools of testing, uh, two different ideas of testing. One is property-based testing. Uh, show me a quick hand if you're familiar with property-based testing. OK, few people. Uh, so what is property-based testing? You could take any system and you could say, OK, what are the properties of this system? Like in case of an open API specification, if a field is optional, then I can say that if I send that particular parameter or if I don't send the parameter, in both cases, I should get back the same response, like a successful response, right? That's one property. If I uh, do not send a mandatory field, then the system should not give me back a 200, right? That's a property of the system. So essentially, by looking at the open API specification, we can generate a bunch of properties and use that as an input to generate tests. The second inspiration we took was from mutation testing. What is mutation testing? So if I have a test which basically verifies that, you know, imagine in my code I have if some condition, then return x, else return y. And so I would have written, let's say, two tests where in one case, the condition is true, and I would assert that I got x back. Another test I would have written where I would have uh, simulated so I get the condition false and I get Y back and I assert that X and Y in each of those respective tests, right? So what mutation testing does is it basically goes and mutates the code. So let's say it makes instead of the condition, it says not of that condition and then it expects two tests to fail. As long as the test fails, it says, okay, this is good. Your tests are valid and they're catching the mutations. If your tests are not catching the mutants, then essentially your tests are not good enough, right? Make sense? So in our case, we are not mutating the code. Instead, we are basically mutating. Uh, we, so we are not mutating the code. Instead, we are mutating the requests. So we are basically playing around with the requests. And we are saying, if I don't send a mandatory one, I should get a 400. If I change the data type of something, then I should get a 400 back, right? And that's, what, that's how we have been able to generate 41 tests out of this. So quick recap, we started with just an open API specification. We generated seven tests when we started. We had five tests passing, two were failing, and we saw some mismatches between the open API specification and your actual implementation. So we fixed those typos and stuff like that. And then uh, we generated examples to guide Specmatic. And then we went down to three examples, right? Three tests. Then we turned on generative tests, and we got 41 tests. There was, again, some mismatch between the specification. We were able to fix that. And now we have 41 tests passing. All of this, again, without writing a single line of code. Right? I keep repeating that without writing a single line of code because I think like this is all mundane stuff. Like why would you sit and write, you know, tests, code for stuff like this? All right. So this is good, but not happy yet, right? What else could we do? Notice here, we've been able to exercise the 200 and 400, which is why we are now at 67% coverage. But we still have this 500 left, and we have not exercised that. 
So how do I exercise the 500? So now I have 41 tests, which requires, let's say, the downstream service to respond back to me. But let's say I want to now write a new test, which will uh, expect the downstream service to time out or not respond back at all, right? And I want to make sure that my service can now give me a 503 back, and I can verify that a 503 is, in fact, working as expected, right? OK, that's a little confusing. So let me go to the slide and see if that would be helpful. So my BFF layer is making a request to the domain service. OK, now imagine the domain service uh, here in your BFF layer, you have a timeout, right? If the, B if the domain service does not respond back to you, let's say within three seconds, then you want to timeout, OK? Uh, when it times out, basically the BFF layer can't really do much. It's going to give you back a 503 service not available, right? Now I want to simulate that. I want to actually test if I have timeouts are being implemented correctly or not, right? What if the developer has completely forgotten to implement any timeout and it's just going to infinitely wait for the domain service to respond? So I want to simulate this condition where a downstream service is misbehaving, but I want my service to still adhere to whatever its specifications are. How would you do that? Yeah? So you send requests to the BFF layer. And that might uh, take down the BFF layer itself, which would be an interesting test, like a DDoS on the BFF, right? But what I want to do is I want to see if the downstream service times out, right? Then the BFF is still behaving the way I expect it to behave, right? If the downstream is timing out, I don't want this guy to keep infinitely waiting, correct? So I want this guy to respond back. Cool, so you could uh, mock the downstream and then simulate these conditions, correct? But for the 41 tests, I do want this, that guy to be there. It's just that for the one test, I don't want the guy to respond back on time, right? So one way to do is watch, see the 41 tests run, and then when the 42nd test is about to go, shut down this service, right? That's one way to do it, but life's too short for that. So what I'm going to uh, show you is a technique where uh, Specmatic can actually stub out a service, right? Uh, however, uh, let's imagine I don't have an open API specification because someone says, hey, that's an internal service, so we're not going to give you an open API specification. So what do we do? We have a feature in Specmatic where you can generate the open API specification, okay? So I'm gonna go, this is called proxy. So I'm gonna say, hey, Specmatic, run a proxy for host 8090, which is where my domain service is running, okay? And record whatever you see, right? So this is your classic uh, service virtualization, right? So I'm basically now, Specmatic says, okay, proxy server started on port 9000. What do I do? In my application properties, instead of 8090, now I'm going to make this 9000. So I'm telling Specmatic that domain service is now available on 9000. All right. Once that I've done this change, I have to uh, restart my domain, uh, the BFF layer, to make sure that it is up and running on that port or at least is looking for, cool. So let's clear this. Now let me run this test, and you would see that on the proxy, a bunch of traffic is going through it, and it's recording all the traffic, okay? It stopped. And this test has no clue at this stage, right? It's just run the way it was running, 41 are still there, 41 has passed. But what's happened here is it's recorded all of this, and let me now just kill this. And when you kill, it'll just basically spit out everything that it kind of recorded, okay? 
let's look here what has happened. So there is a folder called recording. Remember I said put whatever you find in the recording folder and it's generated a open API specification for me for the downstream service, the domain service, all right? And it's generated 13 stub files, which is nothing but a request response pair for me, right? But notice one thing, right? We had 41 tests, but we only have 13 uh, of these files, stub files. So we call this intelligent service virtualization. It's not dumb. It's not just capturing every request response and storing it as is. It's actually looking and deduping of all of that and, and kind of saying, OK, you know, this is just a variation of that. This is just a variation of that and kind of condenses it down to 13 unique uh, request response pairs. Right? So we call that intelligent service virtualization because that's trendy, right? All right, so now I have these stub files. What do I do? I say specmatic stub and take this YAML file and run it as a stub. And it's loaded all of them. It says, OK, I have this running here. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my domain service, which is running on port 8090. I'm going to kill that because I no longer need this guy sitting around, right? Let's now go ahead and run the test again. What would we expect to see? Forty-one tests, all passing, but we see one failure. It's not magic, right? Uh, What's happened is, let's look at why it failed, right? It says, okay, uh, negative scenario, I expected a 400, but I have got a 201 back. Why did this happen? Let's look at this particular thing that's failed. Okay. So it's made a request, and notice here, type is 989. But remember, type was an enum with only those four values, right? So the stub that was generated, the YAML file that was generated, uh, did not capture this aspect that a particular, uh, you know, the enum uh, for the type is only of these four values. So I'm going to just copy this thing. Uh, and go to the stub, the generated uh, stub over here, and I'm going to just let it know that it should, whenever it gets a request of uh, here, type query, it should only accept, uh, it should only accept this enum. So the stub that it generated, uh, the YAML file, the contract, that uh, did not have this uh, captured. It couldn't figure that out. So we have to guide it a little bit, saying, OK, whenever a request comes, you have to accept this. Same thing in the request body. There's also, again, a type, uh, which is here. So we have to let it know that that also should be of type. So these are the two changes I'd have to do. All right. We're still trying to figure out if we can do this ourselves, but for now, we're not yet there, so you'd have to guide this a little bit. Uh, that, so that's a little bit of a caveat or a drawback. Any of you want to contribute to that, that would be great. And let me run this now again. 41 tests. And all 41 passing, right? Of course, still no 500 because all we have done is we've just been able to stub out the downstream service. Now that we've stubbed it out, now we have full control, right? We can play around with it any which ways we want. So what can we do now? Remember, we wanted to simulate a situation where we should be able to time out the downstream service. So to be able to do that, I'm going to go to my specification. I'm going to go to... Uh, slash find, and notice we have these examples uh, over here. 
where we are saying uh, this is an example of success where the type that we are sending as a parameter gadget. I'm just going to create another uh, example over here. I'm going to call it timeout. Okay. Uh, Copilot is already saying, okay, you looks like you would want a value like this, and I'm say other, right? There were four options. I'm going to say anytime I'm going to send other, then timeout. All right. Uh, similarly, I'm just going to put a timeout here, and let's say 99. And finally, when I get a response back here in my uh, this thing. I should have examples and example timeout, and this should be the response back. So what I'm basically telling is anytime I send a request for find products with a type equals other, I expect a 500 back, all right? So let me just do that change and uh, run this test. 41 tests were there, remember? So I'm gonna go ahead and run this test now. So now it's generated 42 tests. So it's added one more test because I've added an example, all right? And sure enough, that test has failed, right? This is basically saying, hey, I expected a 503, but I'm still getting a 200 back. Why? Because we've not done anything on the stub side. We've just set the expectation that on the this guy side. So now we'll go and quickly set the expectation and I want to show you how simple it is to do that. So here I have a slash products which takes gadget, right? So I'm just going to duplicate this, call it as timeout. And on the timeout, I'm going to say other. OK? And then here, I'm going to basically specify delay delay in seconds, all right, delay in seconds to be five seconds. That's the only change I need to make. Give an example, just copy an existing one, give an example, and specify delay in seconds five. So take five seconds before you respond back, all right? Every time I make a change, you will notice that this automatically reloads the specification, so I don't need to do anything with the proxy uh, the stub server, it automatically does that. Let's go back to this and let's clean this out and run this. 42 tests. One test was failing last time. 42 tests, all 42 tests succeeded. You see this 503 is covered and you have 100% coverage on this. Right? So this is as simple as basically being able to try out different fault injection scenarios. Cool? Isn't that great? Again, without? Single line of code. <laughs> All right, uh, someone can argue that the JSON files are code and you did copy them, but sure enough. Cool, so with this notice, I've been able to get to 100% API coverage. Of course, there are two more scenarios and I can cover them as well, but you get the point, all right? So let me quickly, by the way, all of this stuff I've been doing through this interactive IDE mode, but I don't expect developers to keep doing this, right? So you can actually run all of this through, uh, so I have a contract test over here. You'll notice that in this contract test, I'm uh, basically specifying, so this is a programmatic way of running this, right? So I'm specifying where my uh, application is, localhost 8080, I have, uh, you know, stub running on 9000, I have this. I mean, it's not running, you're saying this is where you would want to run it. And then in the before all, you essentially uh, specify where are your stubs, uh, start the Kafka mock, start the application, and similarly, in the shutdown, the shutdown. Uh, this is the only one-time code that you would have to do. This also is generated, by the way. You don't actually handwrite it. You don't even have to give those properties. And once you do that, you'd be able to generate the same 42 tests that you were seeing 
programmatically. Now I could run this in my CI pipeline. Whenever a developer raises a pull request, I would actually run this and make sure that no contract is broken before I accept the PR, right? So this becomes part of your you know, regular development process and it's not like being individually, like manually being done. Cool? All right, with that, let me just quickly summarize what did we see so far. All right, so we have the BFF, which was the system under test for us. Uh, okay, we have uh, Specmatic, which is basically running those contract tests for you uh, using the open API specification. Similarly, we have Specmatic, which is also being used to stub out the downstream services, right? Uh, again, using the open API specification. We also use Specmatic to generate the Kafka stub which essentially uses async API to generate an in-memory broker uh, and create a topic on which it's listening. And uh, it also does schema validations. I'll show that in a minute. So essentially, the test initially sets the expectation from those JSON files that we had onto the Specmatic stub. Then it also sets the expectation on the async, then makes a request which goes to the stub. The stub responds back, posts a message on the topic, and then gives a response back. Once it gets the response, it basically validates if the response is as per the schema or not. And then finally also verifies if on the, uh, the messages that were posted on Kafka, whether they are as per the specifications uh, in, in the sense of whether the message format meets your expectation and the count, how many messages were actually sent, right? So that's kind of the full cycle of uh, what we call as contract tests over here. So what is actually happening here? We have uh, open API or async API, which basically you can use for intelligent service virtualization, right? Which means the consumer can now talk to this, uh, you know, mock or stub, whatever you like to call it, without actually having to depend on the real service, right? This very same API specification can also be used against the provider to generate contract tests against it, right? So this now becomes your single source of truth that basically validates if the, uh, essentially the provider is adhering to this and using the same thing, I can basically stub out the provider and do my thing as a consumer, right? That's the key idea over here. You have the same specification which is used both by the provider and consumer and we put that into a single source of truth so all uh, API, open API, or async API specifications we put into a Git repo, all right? Uh, and it goes through, again, a PR process to get into the Git repo. The first part of the PR process does linting to make sure that the open API specification or async API specification is as per the standards that you've agreed in your company. Uh, next thing it does, it's backward compatibility or compatibility testing, all right? What is compatibility testing? So let's assume I have a version of the spec that is already in. Now I want to add new uh, endpoints or I want to add a new parameter to the existing specification because APIs are always evolving. But when I do that, I want to make sure that I didn't accidentally break the compatibility, right? Now to be able to do that, uh, essentially, again, you would leverage Specmatic to do backward compatibility testing. This was almost an accidental finding uh, that we had. We said, hey, if I can use the same spec for generating tests as well as generating a mock, now guess what I can do? I can take the new version of the spec that's come in, I can take the old version of the spec that's already there uh, in the thing, so now I have version, the old version and the new version. What can I do with it? I can take the new version, run it as a stub. So now I have a stub server running. I take the old version and I run it as tests against the stub. If all the tests pass, then guess what? The new version is backward compatible, right? It's a trivial idea, but it's, kind of quite profound, you can actually do this, and now I can actually be sure that my new version is backward compatible. You can flip the order and say, is it forward compatible or not, right? So you can do full compatibility testing on this. 
That's kind of the idea of the central Git repo, and then of course someone will review and merge the PR. So to quickly summarize, uh, we have Specmatic, which can leverage the open API or async API. In fact, we also work with uh, SOAP, by the way, because we realize quite a few companies also use SOAP and stuff like that. Uh, so you can take the specification. So on the consumer side, they can do their development locally and test everything locally. Similarly, the providers can use this almost like a test-driven development cycle where you would start with the open API specification. You'll generate a bunch of tests. All of them will fail. And then you go and basically use GPT to generate the code, right? Because nobody writes code these days. So you can just keep generating code and keep seeing all your tests pass, right? That's pretty much the cycle we use a lot of times. Uh, and then in the respective CI, you would have each of them uh, run these things, of course, using Specmatic to stub out the other thing. Because in my pipeline, I don't want the provider a dependency on the provider, right, as a consumer. So I can decouple, individually test each of these, but still be sure that nothing's going to go wrong because uh, essentially we are talking to the single source of truth, the same version of the specification, right? This is one problem with a lot of other alternatives where you'd see them drift away, and then when they get into some kind of an integration environment, surprise, surprise, right? Like, things have evolved. So here, you expect not to see any surprises. At least that's been our experience, having tested this, battle-tested this for four years now. And then your path to production is clean, right? And you figuring out things as early as possible in the cycle, so that's the true shift left. Uh, and not figuring out these late in the development cycle, right? And this is what truly allows you to independently develop and deploy things. You no longer have to bring everything to an integrated environment, test everything together, and then say, okay, you can go ahead. Because so then you're losing the entire benefit of microservices. Is it making sense? All right. Uh, I talked about insights. Uh, so again, accidental finding. We said if we have, uh, I'm, I'm going to wrap up in two minutes. Uh, so we said if you're going to have uh, all these tests running in the pipelines and generating all this data, can you do something with it? And the answer is yes, you can do a lot of interesting things with it, right? Uh, so you can generate things like this where, you know, you can actually visualize all your uh, services and how they interact with each other or how they're dependent on each other, right? And like some of the CTOs we've shown this, they're like, oh, why do we have this circular dependency? You know, why is this guy depending on this and then this guy's depending on that, right? Uh, so you start visualizing your landscape of services. Uh, you don't have to wait till you go to production and get the logs and then visualize. You do this much earlier. So if you're basically having wrong uh, connections, or if you're having bottlenecks or stuff like that, you can figure that out very early in the cycle, right? Uh, you can actually click on each of these and uh, stuff like that. So if you go to insights.specmatic.in, uh, you'll be able to play around with this. There are examples for you to do that. You can then look at an individual service and see, okay, what are the dependencies of this service and who's calling this service? Right? Because most often when I'm about to change some service, I actually have no idea who's calling me, what are they you know, dependent on me, or who am I dependent on. Who I'm dependent on still, you know, at least the developers would know, but who's calling you, sometimes you're not very sure about them. Right? So you can get that and you can also see, is it a HTTP dependency, a Kafka dependency, a Redis dependency, what kind of dependency do I have? Right? And then uh, you can actually see what's, Overall, across all your projects, what's your API coverage, right? And how many uh, specs are there actually in the central repo versus not in the central repo or floating around in some emails or stuff like that, right? So you get all these real-time dashboards for you to be able to visualize what's your current CDD, contract-driven development adoption in your company, right? Make sense? Uh, go to the link here and play around with it. Uh, again, just a reminder, we can do JMS uh, mocking as well using this. Uh, we can do uh, JDBC stubbing. Uh, so this is, again, something a lot of uh, teams need. Uh, is they have extremely complicated database interactions and stuff like that, and for the testing, they want to stub out that. So you know, the same approach can basically be used uh, for JDBC stubbing. 
uh, or Redis for that matter. Uh, the point I'm trying to make here is the way Specmatic is architected is each of these protocols or each of these different kinds of things are essentially plug in into the architecture, right? So you can now add uh, anything else you want to add as a plugin into it. Okay, so with that, I'm going to shut up and hopefully this was uh, useful for you.